exactly the kinds of things that we need action around. I mean, coordination seems to be a huge challenge. Um, just let me start out by suggesting a few things. It seems to me that there are a number of synergies. There are a number of synergies here that are already in place. Um, one of the things that came up this morning with uh, General Sutton was the idea that military medicine actually teaches us a lot, teaches civilian medicine a lot. We learn a lot, unfortunately, from from the kinds of measures that are taken to help uh, people who are wounded in war. And a lot of that has been trans translated into the private sector or into the civilian sector, uh, certainly plastic surgery is one of those things, emergency medicine and so forth. And, uh, and it seems, to, seems that that's an ongoing process that we're learning from that, them every day. Uh, we're, I mean, civilian uh, physicians are learning from military physicians every day. Um, a second uh, synergy seems to be, or, or a place where there's not as much opposition as we might think, is this idea that military families are not so separate, they're not so distinct or different from the rest of us, that they live in our communities and that their children attend schools with civilian children. So that kind of, there, there's, not the, there's not as much of a gap there as, we, as perhaps we tend to think. Um, a third synergy is um, something that, uh, that Kathy Roth Duque uh, brought up, and that is, that the military, at least in her view, and this is something we could perhaps debate, but that the milita a military is necessary in a democracy, that a military is not some alien entity that is visited upon democracies, but it's part and parcel of democracies. And so there, there has to, obviously has to be mutual responsibility, mutual support there. But that said, it also seems to me that there are a number of, um, of tension, sources of tension, gaps, uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, and one and one of them goes right back to the idea that um, the mil the military and democracy go together. There is a tension between the military and democracy. This is a, a political debate. There's a difference between military life and civilian life. Just in planning this conference, or just in listening to a lot of I mean, we talked about vocabulary before and the need to learn all these acronyms. You know, it's alphabet soup to me. A lot of this. This is like when you teach students about the New Deal and all the the names of all the agencies. That's nothing compared to all the acronyms that seem to be floating around in the military. So, and maybe one of the ways uh, speak speaking about what, what Flip just said, um, educating the public is to sort of break down a lot of these acronyms and explain what they mean. Um, I know it's shorthand and people, people use shorthand when they talk to one another, but it's, it's kind of off-putting for people who don't know what they mean. Um, another attention that I picked up a lot from a lot of people was uh, the sort of attention between self-organization, um, self-help, being able to take care of yourself, being independent on the one hand, and seeking services on the other. And it seems to me that one of the barriers, perhaps, to seeking services, again, goes back to something that Laurie Sutton said, which is this, especially for people with uh, PTSD or other kinds of invisible injuries, and that is um, the stigma that's attached to it. So there's a tension between, on the one hand, seeking help, uh, wanting to help yourself, um, or on the other hand, seeking help, but seeking help means perhaps facing a stigma, or perhaps, in, given the political climate these days, um, a resistance to getting in more involved with government. I mean, you've already been involved with the government when you're in the military, but once you're out of the military, maybe you just want to stay away from, uh, from anything associated with the government. So I think we can't really discount the political climate that's going on right now. Um, one of the other um, tensions that I, or one of, one of the, uh, not necessarily attention, but a difference that I picked up on, is that, that seems to me there's a distinction between services for available for families whose me service members are deployed over the long haul, and then people who um, are the services for people who um, are in some kind of a, acute uh, state where their service member comes home in some with some kind of some kind of condition that requires critical attention, acute uh, attention and, and care. And this sort of relates to Shelley's. Um, yellow, green, green, yellow, and red lights. I mean, this is a similar kind of thing. And so one question I actually would have had for the pa previous panel is whether, the, whether you all see those, on a, those things on a continuum or whether you see them as being very distinct. That is, services for helping people over the long haul and people, services for helping people in acute situations, which I also realize can extend for a long time as well when you have someone coming home who needs a great deal of attention and may need it for a long time. So... Um, those are, um, those are just some of the tensions that I see and, and, and you know, things that maybe need to be addressed before moving ahead. But then the other, I mean, the other huge thing, I think, is the fact that there is such a pro proliferation of agencies and organizations, private and public, government and civilian, 
uh, I mean, government, within the government, military, civilian, uh, et cetera, so many different agencies, so much um, stove piping, as we, as we have, as I have learned to call it since coming to the Wilson Center, um, you know, and how to break down those barriers or, or, or um, you know, or is it better to have a lot of independent organizations and agencies working and, you know, pursuing different ideas? Um, you know, I don't, which, I'm not sure which is more productive. But anyways, those are some of the questions that have occurred to me in the course of the day, and I'd love to hear from the rest of you and uh, think about ways of moving, you know, trying to, to move, where to move forward, how to move forward. Yes. Yeah, Chachin, I would like to have some suggestion for what we talked about last uh, panel. And uh, this is uh, to serve, to be served or to offer the serve. Uh, O'Neill said uh, policy is local. I think this should be local too. Uh, uh, for the civilian community, the unit is uh, uh, chamber of commerce, and I think spouse should be organized too. Maybe already have, and these two group have a regular meeting. So, what the sir want, and what they, uh, what the other side can offer the sir, then this can match up. So Thank you're saying you. that service members should meet with chambers of commerce, yeah, yeah on, a, on a regular basis. Yeah, back there. Yeah. Um, I'll just speak up, I guess. Yeah. One, one of the issues, I think, you know. Aldo, can you just reach out? Yeah, I think it's. Okay. Referring back to what Dr. Sutton said this morning about the, you know, that medicine has learned a lot from the military, um, and clearly the best childcare in the country came from the military model. But I think one of the problems with this gap is that the military doesn't necessarily always learn from the civilian sector. Uh, Joyce had a great idea about tweeting, you know, the, these young, these young um, uh, service members who might respond to that better than a senior officer's wife's. Well, HHS has a plan called, um, what, did I, what did I just say it was called? Text for Baby. They give young, vulnerable, pregnant women, uh, you know, so, uh, cell phones, and they text them, they tell them what's going on in child development in their womb, and they remind them when it's time to get a checkup, and, so you get, a, you get a text every couple of days during your entire pregnancy, which often helps you. Helps you. Uh, one of the hot new ideas in getting underserved families legal services is to put legal clinics in emergency rooms. And while the parents are waiting, they say, are you having any other problems? Are you getting your child support? Um, are you having any landlord-tenant problems? We're here to help. You know, again, the idea of going to where the families are. So there are a lot of models, and I, uh, routinely the military community is just left out of discussions about vulnerable families. I was at something at Brookings the other morning and they were talking about studying stress on babies and how it has both behavioral and health implications for the rest of their lives. And I raised my hand and said, what about the two million kids in the military who are leading stressful lives? And they said, we hadn't thought about that. These are preeminent child you know, researchers who are not looking at military kids. That it's, it's, they're in a separate component. The Interagency Autism Coordinating Council is meeting today. There are a lot of autistic kids in the military, the same, about the same as the general population, but there's no military parent on that committee. So um, you know, there's a group called the Children's Leadership Council, which is a coalition of all the child advocacy groups, um, and they have not invited the National Military Family Association to join them. So I just think that, that that's where some of the disconnects are, and um, you know, there could be a lot of, uh, of, of good um, you know, of good networking back and forth um, if, if while the public is paying attention, the public would reach out to the military and the, and the Defense Department would reach out to, to the civilian community in that respect. Um, maybe Joyce or Shelley might have some thoughts about this. I mean, is there a way in which the military sort of presents itself as being self-contained and they don't want, uh, you know, advice from other people or they don't necessarily want to partner with other people? It's, it's been amazing how much the military partners um, that Liza talked about just in terms of the, the, the child and youth side, 4-H uh, program, USDA, Boys and Girls Club, private organization. I mean, there are, the military is reaching out, and I think what we've also seen is the reversal. Uh, Private organizations that didn't used to think about the military are now saying, okay, what can we take of what we're doing and translate into service to support the military? 
um, you know, I, your meeting at Brookings, I'm wondering where zero to three was. I'm wondering where Sesame Workshop was. Both civilian oriented, well respected organizations that have over the last few years embraced the military um, and added a lot of knowledge to military providers and, and people like me who work with the military added a lot of resources. So it, I don't, and there's more all the time. I think Mary talked about the, the partnership with you and Gallup and, and work with the Department of Ed. So I, th I think it's, there, there are just a lot of groups out there and it's, we're still making connections, but what I've found is the, the same thing, that when people, if they haven't thought about it, when they're asked, they go, well, duh, of course, and they do reach out. So I'm really encouraged by that, but there are a lot of organizations out there and sometimes, you know, they can come to us as well as we can go to them. Shelly and then, and then Jen. I'm one of those people out in communities, you know, so I sort of work on both sides of the street. I would say there are some um, sort of impediments or just tensions, and I would label them standards, scale, and culture. So the standards barrier is that the military can't, because for a whole variety of reasons, get involved with organizations that don't meet really transparent standards of excellence. So the military is never going to get involved with unlicensed child care, for example, which is a really sensible thing, but if there's a community that has nothing but unlicensed care, it doesn't help for military families very much for the military to say our standards exceed what you have in your community, so, you know, see ya. Um, scale is that the military is so big. DOD can't afford to make 3,000 different deals with 3,000 different communities. They are looking for national organizations, but a lot of times that leaves the church down the street and the local family services agency out there wanting to help and not able to. And the culture issue is that I think the military still sometimes trips over the ethos of we take care of our own. It's our job to take care of our own. So we're not always really excited about letting other people do it, or there's a line beyond which we think we shouldn't go. Jennifer, yeah. I just wanted to say in this respect, too, that I think that probably one of the things that has happened, I mean, from a historical perspective, <clears throat> the Army, at least, has had some partnerships that ha it has sustained over the years in a very basic way with things like the Red Cross or something like that. Um, but for, I think for, in, in terms of we're talking about the volunteer force, for much of the 80s and the 90s, um, the military didn't feel very much of an excessive need to partner um, with private entities and civilians and things like that. And that, in fact, it's the war, the wars that have sensitized um, people in the civilian community to these issues a little bit more. And I've, I've heard a number of people say today, and it is worth asking, and I'm interested in it from a historical perspective, what happens when the wars are over? Um, and many people have said, <laughs> I mean, uh, do these partnerships get sustained? Are they, are they thought about in that way? Do they really take into consideration what a reconversion, I mean, we're not having a wholesale reconversion because these are different types of wars, but you know, return to you know some notion of, of peace. Will there be downsizing the military? I mean, we don't know what's going to happen, but w how are these being structured in ways that lead to a kind of a permanent or more permanent integration of military and civilian than we saw, for example, in the 80s and, and 90s? So I'm I'm really curious about that. Yeah. Ma'am, my name is uh, Quinn Skinner. I'm the Deputy Director for Family Policy under Barbara Thompson at DOD. And I acknowledge the, uh, the partnerships issue, but if I could just run through some current initiatives that are directly in that lane, just to make you aware of things that are going on. And I, I, don't, I don't claim them as solutions, but uh, they're a start on a lot of things. First, the, uh, the National Security Staff has begun convening a military family policy or a military family interagency policy committee with all the agencies in one room and from that they've spun off working groups that partner on different issues uh, the three specific ones are 
behavioral health, education, and child care. And so, for example, the behavioral health one, which, met this, which meets weekly and met this morning, talks about how partnership with HHS and leveraging block grants and uh, reaching out to families and developing a kind of a, uh, an interagency nationwide or spectrum of services that are available to families could be offered for behavioral health issues. And there's similar initiatives with child care, uh, kind of addressing com what, what community capacity can be uh, leveraged, but still bringing up those community standards so that they, they do meet the, the standards issue that uh, Dr. Wadsworth mentioned. So these kind of things are going on. Another one is uh, we have, we've just, just signed uh, on Wednesday a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Agriculture that um, we can provide, start providing them funding directly for services and research through the cooperative extension system at the land-grant universities. Um, so they, they're helping us with both services directly in the community and in kind of the research evaluation piece of the programs that do exist. Um, there was, in addition to the, the, the conference hosted by Blue Star Families, uh, a National Leadership Summit back in November of 2009 that you know, we hope will continue to bridge the gap that uh, Ms. Roth Decay talked about between academia and, and, and military, because it was hosted by the University of Maryland. Uh, with USDA and DOD, uh, kind of a, a triumvirate there of a hosting, and they came up with six strategic action, or sorry, three strategic action items. Specifically, those were creating a strategic map of all the existing programs. Uh, number two, uh, designing, implementing a strategic, strategic communications plan to, to improve the awareness of these programs and reviewing and further developing behavioral health services to encourage early identification and treatment of behavioral health issues. And then in addition to that, um, some things that were already going on at DOD in collaboration with USDA is, uh, and, and land-grant universities was ex establishing a family readiness clearinghouse that, that, to which various programs can be vetted. Uh, that's Penn State that's heading that up. Uh, ex expanding child care capacity that kind of gets to the the uh, partnership with HHS and then just continuing to build these partnerships with uh, with academic and community based organizations so and like I said we don't we don't claim these as the panacea and it's all fixed and uh, but th these are efforts that are ongoing uh, uh, especially in the last year year or so to start solidifying some of these and particularly in the last few months with the Interagency Policy Committee on Military Families, I think you'll see more of this kind of outreach going on. Um, there is also, you know, um, like Dr. McDermott Wadsworth talked about, uh, the, you know, the standard scale and culture, and that's, that's a good, good model, but particularly with the standards, there are some things that uh, aren't going to meet some established standard but that doesn't preclude the community from reaching out to the military families in their midst. I'm a former commanding officer and I've lived in a variety of neighborhoods and there are some neighborhoods where the neighbors came over and see how we were doing and other neighborhoods that were entirely oblivious. So to what extent uh, academic institutions, the government and just the community writ large could just be aware, be aware of their own neighbors, that would be a good thing. So. I think we just need to distinguish this. Is, I'm switching to Quinn Skinner's personal opinion here uh, between what needs to be communicated as a formal government or academic position and what can be done on an informal level by the neighbors on your own block uh, to reach out to the families around them. Because, uh, you know, when my two-year-old busted his mouth open on the tile floor and my wife took him over to ask advice of the neighbor what, what she should do and the, that, that neighbor took my younger infant, that's respite child care right there. So, you know, if you, and if you have that kind of relationship with your neighbors, then 
program, schmogram. I, you, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not belittling programs, but that sense of community is uh, not consistent a across the nation. And if, if you want to really build on something, that would be worthwhile. But I just want to, like I say, that's Quint Skinner's opinion, but th those are the things I mentioned before about the partnerships with uh, other federal agencies. And uh, we have a, a long-standing relationship with National Military Family Association and more recently Blue Star Families and MOA and, and other uh, in the Military Child Education Coalition and Zero to Three and the whole host of those. I think those partnerships are, uh, are, are vibrant. Uh, and, and, and again, we, don't, we wouldn't claim those as, you know, as a, as a destination and that, we're, that we're finished. But um, I think it would be, re be remiss to say that we haven't established those relationships. Yeah, Joyce. I'd like to address the issue of sustainability that, because I think it's critical and it's what keeps me up at night because I've seen a lot of, I see a lot of support every day now but I, I guess my big hope in the sustainability issue is that when the people in this room meet with their congressional representative two years after the war, the war ends and the congressional re representative is talking about taxes and is talking about government spending, somebody's asking the question, and how are we supporting our military families and our veterans who are still dealing with the legacy of the war? And I would hope that the Wilson Center, two years after the, de the Iraq and Afghanistan deployments end, are having another one of these, these conferences to ask the same question. Because we should be worrying about that. That's our nation's legacy. We should be worrying about it from the national security side. Military recruiting people should be reading res our research and other research about military children because they're going to want military kids to keep going into the family business. Our nation should care about the health of our military down the road. Our nation should care about the health of veterans and military spouses because we're in the labor force. We're, 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 we can be contributors or we can be resource drainers. So our nation needs to care about that as we're talking about taxes and government spending and, and government programs, and we need to be continuing it in the future. One of the, I'm just going to interject a comment and then I'll call on you. One of the things, uh, one of the first things I ever did as a historian, I'm a, trained as a historian, was to do edit a book called Behind the Lines, Gender in the Two World Wars. It came out in the early 80s. No, in the late 80s. And um, one of the things, one of the points we made, uh, historians talk a lot about periodization. When does something begin? When does something end? And we talked about how from the perspective of women especially, wars don't begin with the first shot and end with the treaty. They go on and on and on because the caregiving and the caretaking is something that extends, can extend for a lifetime. So that's exactly the kind of, you know, the kind of thing. So I say to you, I hope that the deployments end very soon, but I promise you that we will continue to talk about this here at the Wilson Center. Uh, there was a hand back there. Uh, yeah, Iris and then Christy. Thank you. Um, I'll be very brief. <clears throat> I'm a communication strategist, and I'm listening to the dynamic in this room. And one of the things that occurs to me is that there are some programs that some organizations have with some agencies. And it would seem to me that it would make sense for the interagency council to meet with all of the people who have the programs because there's you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you don't have to continue to think well we have a program with with uh, HHS or we have a program with DOD or we have a program with whoever you know it should be an ongoing conversation between all of these groups that have worked so hard and actually know what the needs are and the people who are on the interagency council who can then go back to their uh, to their to their departments, or um, and say, you know, there's this program that exists. Instead of spending the money to figure out how we can reinvent that, let's why don't we just give the money to these people and let them do it? I mean, I was sort of thinking about that when Sarah Manzano Diaz was talking about the Women's Bureau. I was thinking, why is the Women's Bureau getting into this business? You know, are they duplicating? But on the other hand, she's raising an issue. They're raising an issue that it's a voice. It's an important voice that needs to be at the table because if if they're not focusing on it, then that's an issue that might disappear. Right. But she. But where she could have picked up the phone and called Kathy, who has 243 organizations, to say we're looking for homeless women, 
you know, they had 50 people because they, they don't have that kind of... Right. You know, women don't go to homeless shelters because it's dangerous. And women, you don't know how to identify them and they don't have computers and they don't have technology. So, you know, you're, gonna, you're missing a big portion of, the, of the, your population with homeless women when you don't actually reach out into all the communities. Right. Just pass the mic over. <laughs> Had to slip out there for about an hour. I missed the last panel. So I, exactly what you're saying, I think one of the frustrations that all of us feel, whether we're at the very top in the policy or we're down at the bottom, is that there has been such an incredibly robust effort, particularly in the past couple of years, to try to deal with this. Of course, we're all kind of in a reactionary mode, which kind of puts us behind the power curve. But one of the things that, that we've been recommending is really an outside overall assessment, not just of what DOD and OSD offers or the particular services, but, but the nonprofits and academia and the DECO and really having an org, basically a, like a Ernst & Young, whatever type of, and I know that costs money and probably won't happen, but I feel like if, until we really get a handle on the enormity of the resources out there, it's going to be very hard to piecemeal getting rid of the duplicative uh, programs and and really we're spending the money so we want to spend it as effectively as possible. So that would be my, my first point. And my final point would be it seems from, from being on the ground for the past eight or nine years is how do we incentivize responsibility and accountability? And that is not just at the soldier or family member level. And I think it's very important to be a culture of self-sufficiency that we are. It's one of the greatest things about, about the military culture. Um, but then how do we incentivize that with, with the community at large? H how, does the, uh, how does academia play a part in, in spreading that message through the student community? I mean, we have the people that are serving are generally, not, a lot of them are under 25. So there's a lot of parallels that you can draw you know, within the university community. So my concern sometimes is that we're pushing it down too much to the lowest level. We're expecting enormous amounts of resiliency, and I think it's in, in, important to teach people resiliency, but at the same time, what are we doing to make the organizations more flexible and resilient? And that, I think it's, it's important to focus on both and not just keep pushing it down, because at some point, and I can tell you this from personal experience, we all hit a wall. I'm pretty high functioning. I, you know, I, I came in when I was 31, but I'll tell you what, my husband's about to go on his fourth deployment. I'm about done. You know, and, and if I'm there, you know, where, where are the 22 and 23 year olds? So yes, expect personal responsibility, teach it, but then let's bring it over, you know, focus on the organizations as well and, and, and include that. Um, Jennifer and I were talking at lunch about the, the, the shift from a draft to an all, to an all volunteer army. And, you know, if, and if, I think if we think historically, when we think about, I mean, I know we tend to romanticize World War II, but when we think about it, you know, the times when there was the greatest and most widespread public support for the military was during the time when there was a draft. Uh, well, not during Vietnam, but <laughs> during World War II anyway. So, I mean, I think it's an unintended consequence of the all, all volunteer army. You know, that the fact is that when you have an all volunteer army, you know, I, and this is, you know, I think what Kathy was criticizing and other people have mentioned it, you know, you sort of say, well, okay, that's being taken care of over there by them. And it's not a responsive. And then, and then you add on to that this, this sort of ideal of self containment within the military. And, and you add on to that alphabet soup and you have, alien, you know, a self isolation, alienation, and, you know, in the sense that, and, and, you know, in the sense that maybe we don't all have, you know, we're paying our taxes, that's it. You know, we don't have to do anything more than that. So I don't know. I think it's I think it's something to to think about. I don't know, Jen. Do you want to have a thought about that? Well, I have a lot of of, of thoughts about that, and and they're, <laughs> I'm I'm still um, hashing them all out. But um, when I I was talking with Kathy out in the hallway about it, and um, and I, I mean it does seem that there is there there are these c kind of feedback effects or I don't know what you call them, maybe in military problems like blowback effects from the iso the relative isolation of the volunteer force and from that long term policy decision that you know that can have 
negative consequences for civilians and for military families. And I mean, I think some of what we're talking about here today is probably the result of that. And so, I mean, it could, if we wanted to, raise very big questions about, you know, what do we think of this policy? And one of the things Kathy and I were talking about in the hallway, and I know that if I bring this up, it just bing, 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 sets things off. But I mean, you know, a concept of national service, where you extend notions of service more broadly. Um, and so if civilians feel, um, are, are, people feel in, in, in American society feel widely implicated in national service. And I think it, it, it sort of de-emphasizes the selectivity of military service and sectioning it off. It brings maybe civilian and military communities together, even though not everyone will be doing the same type of service. Um, but I mean, those are things that you could think about, and they might be long-term policy decisions that might lead to greater long-term civilian-military partnerships and other things like that. But uh, I'm starting to learn that that um, bringing that up sometimes in military environments, um, it just it Dangerous. opens a can of worms that it may not be directly related to this. Um, but I've, I've lost I've lost my watch, so I don't know what time it is. What time is it? Five. Okay, well then I think it's time to, to uh, continue the conversation over some wine and cheese. And to thank, once again, thank all of you for coming. Thanks to Chuck Dubrow for his support. And thanks to the Wilson Center staff for all your great help.